Back in September, I was invited down to Sony headquarters to test out what has now been confirmed as Project Leonardo and also act as a bit of a consultant. Now, I'm going to talk about the process that happened and everything that happened during testing. Unfortunately, guys, I can't actually do that. I signed an NDA, so I can't talk about anything that happened during testing, what the device looked like, the whole process of testing. It's just literally, I cannot say anything because otherwise I'll have Sony's legal team on me and I'm sorry, I don't have a good enough legal team to fight the NDA. So we're not going to do that. Instead, guys, I'm going to run through the blog post and everything that Sony has announced on that blog post and give my thoughts and opinion on purely that blog post so I don't get in any trouble. So obviously Sony start off by saying that the device is designed to remove barriers to gaming that often disabled people have. So those of you who have seen my content a lot know that I really struggle with the typical mouse and keyboard and a controller. So that's why I use different kinds of adaptions like my sip and puff device, uh, my one-handed controller and a mouse and voice macros. Now this is a big issue for literally a lot of people with disabilities. So straight off before the bat, before I start critiquing this and reviewing everything that's been announced in the blog post, any kind of accessibility device that gets produced to help anybody with a disability, I'm giving a huge thumbs up to because every little helps. So firstly, we're going to talk about this paragraph here where they uh, mentioned that through conversations with accessibility experts, I mean, I think that means that I'm an accessibility expert, according to Sony. I don't think I am an expert at all. I'm just an disabled guy that likes the game. But hey, if Sony want to call me an expert, I'll be an expert. Um, and incredible organizations like Able Gamers, Special Effects and Stack Up. So obviously this is really important because you don't want to have a device that's designed for disabled people without input of disabled people. I've seen it a lot in loads of places, such as hotels, um, out and about in general, basically, where you look at places and you think somebody that isn't disabled has clearly designed this because it's out of function. Like disabled toilets, where they have the soap up high and everything like that. It's just crazy sometimes when you go places and it's meant to be wheelchair accessible or disabled accessible um, and it just isn't so it's it's really key that places and companies when when they are designing stuff for disabled people or want things to be accessible to actually talk to disabled people okay let's talk about this bit where they're talking about the highly customizable play experience so from looking at this and what you can see is that all the buttons can be interchanged between each other. So each one of these is an individual button which can be flipped out for different designs and shapes and feels for each one of these. So if you look here, this is more of like a flappy paddle and this is a bit more of a sort of like a curved, I'm trying to think of how to explain, like a wedge. Um, and they've also got longer ones. So if you see here, R1, R2, you've got this one here. So if you push that down, it will push both button three and four. Um, so these can all be switched around. Also, if you look here, we've got interchangeable joysticks. So I'm assuming this one is a bit like, um, let me find a, a better image so we can actually see it better. Like here, so that joystick is like this joystick here, where it's a bit of like your typical arcade gaming joystick, where it's up in the air, helping those that probably haven't got the best grip function to grab it better. Um, I don't know if you can change these or sort of like have it. So I know some disabled people game with like a T-bar. Um, I don't know if that's going to be a thing in the future where they'll bring out different adaptable ones so it is like a T-bar so those that haven't got amazing grip can grip onto stuff like that. I personally wouldn't be able to grip onto that very well, I don't think, uh, in the ball of my hand. So it's, it's one of those things. If, if they do bring out a T-bar in the future or a third party company makes a T-bar, um, that might be more useful for people with disabilities. But uh, we'll see. Um, let's go back down to there. Um, so there's a joystick so they can be interchanged for what looks like your typical controller, little joystick button, and then a wider... F I think that seems flatter. That looks flatter. So obviously from here, you can see here all the different buttons. So there's the PlayStation 1, the L1, L2, L3, and all those. So these buttons, every one of these, can be assigned to a different key binding um, for whatever you want it to be. Um, and it, that, that is really useful, obviously, because you don't want to have to be set um, on whatever button you want as what um because otherwise for me for example even even on a normal controller whenever i use that i remap the key binding so often but even then it, it is quite difficult when i'm sat there looking at my controller and i'm looking down and say normally i'd have l1 or, or not l1 l1's not a good example really but if i'm looking at the x button sometimes i switch the x button typically around to the a button but i do it within the app 
um, rather than within or within the systems controls rather than the in-game key bindings. Um, it, it, you look down, you're obviously looking to press X, but you end up pressing the wrong button um, unless you've got that memory to remember. So it's really useful that these buttons can be switched around and changed. So if you need that visual reminder of what key is or what button is which, you've got it. Um, so that's also one thing I also know from the blog post that these, the, the orientation at which you have the joystick at can be changed. So if you if it's comfy for you to have the joystick pointing at nine o'clock, you can do. If you want it at 12 o'clock, you can do. If you want it at three o'clock, you can do. If you want it at six o'clock, you can do. Or any other angle you want at, it can be at any of those. And it's simple to change the joystick or, or the joystick orientation so it knows which way is north. Um, so that's obviously one key feature they've they've added as well. Because for me, I, I, there would be a way that I'd like the joystick to be sat so then all the other buttons can be easily easily reached. Um, so that's awesome with that. There's mentioned here, um, obviously the button mass thing, that anything can be mapped to what it is, and also multiple buttons can be mapped to the same function. So that's amazing. Um, I think, did I mention about macros? No, they don't mention anything about macros. So uh, I don't know if they've got macros or not, but um, can we register for any function and multiple buttons can be mapped to the same function? Oh uh, yeah, basically like a macro then, yes. So they do mention macros. Um, so, so I'm assuming that means that they can, multiple buttons can be mapped to the same function. Oh yeah, so, so you've got sort of like, if you want to hold L1 and L2 at the same time, I'm assuming that means you can do that. Um, control profiles. Players can store their program button settings as control profiles and easy switch between them by pressing profile button. Up to three control profiles can be stored and accessed by the player. So this is probably the one thing that I would find an issue. Uh, with my one-handed keyboard, I have unlimited profiles. Mainly because I have it for different games I play. So whatever button I play, say so I am playing Valorant, my shift key is when I push the joystick down on my one-handed keyboard. But when I'm playing other games um, like Call of Duty, I think I've got it down as jump because there's auto sprint involved in Call of Duty. Um, so it, it, I have quite a few profiles and I think it's okay if you play one or two games of a similar genre. But if you say play six or seven different games, you're going to have to end up losing a profile, which can be kind of annoying. So that is probably one thing that I personally would want if I could be able to save different profiles, even if I have to go into the menu and change them later on um, without an easy switching button to do it. I'd still prefer that. But that is probably the one thing so far that that would probably irritate me a little bit. Works collaboratively with other devices and accessibility accessibility accessories. So obviously you look at this, there's not got enough buttons with the one controller. So obviously if you're trying to think how many buttons do we normally have? So you've got the two joysticks, that's two. You've got the D-pad, that's another four. You've got your left trigger, right trigger, L1, L2, R2, R1, and those. So you've obviously not got enough initial buttons here um, to control it. So you can add on another DualSense controller or you can add another pre Project Leonardo controller, or also another DualSense. So these can all be joined up and work wirelessly together, which is amazing. No wires taken over your desk. I'm a lazy boy, and I've got so many wires just laying over my desk, and it is a mess. So that is one thing that is probably a big win, I think, over a lot of other things, if they are wireless. Project Leonardo is expandable through four 3.5 millimeter aux ports to support a variety of external switches and third party accessibility accessories. Now, I think this is really key and that is basically what the Xbox adaptive controller is built off. You get your big D-pad on the Xbox adaptive controller and you then have lots of different modular external input devices that you can plug in into these aux cords and use. But they have a wide, wide selection of devices that you can plug in and you can literally have a one plugged in for every key binding or every button that would be on your typical Xbox controller. Here they've only got four. Four, in my opinion, is nowhere near enough. Because I know a lot of people like having the option to plug in as many as they want, different joystick types, different switches and different buttons. So if you're only limited to four, if you've got the one Project Leonardo controller, or eight if you've got two of them. I just don't think that's enough, personally. Um, and it'd be good if they brought out a model with more um, aux ports to plug these in. But it just, it just, I think it removes that flexibility 
that you have in the first place with the four ports. But it just, if you want more, you, you can't have that. But one thing I will say that is a huge win over the Xbox adaptive controller is its out of box use. This controller, you can get it out of the box and you don't have to have external devices in order to use it. The Xbox controller, I've never used one. I mean, I've tested one for like half an hour and used one. But you can't really use it as a games controller without external adaptive devices that you plug in through the aux ports. This, on the other hand, you can. You've got buttons, you've got a joystick, you can then buy two. The reason I think this is a, this is a big win is just cost-wise. The Xbox adaptive controller retails for, I think, about £80. And then normally, each other external adaptive device that you buy, they range from about £40 up to 200 and something. It's, it can be crazy. So if you think you've got, what, I think it's about probably 16 buttons you would normally have on an Xbox controller, that is just an extraordinary amount of money you're going to have to spend to get it fully fur functioning with external devices. So this works probably a big win because it sort of like helps make it more affordable to those with disabilities. You can buy this and it can hopefully help bridge the gap um, with one controller or two um, Project Leonardo controllers. I don't know how much it's going to retail for at the moment. So that's one thing we obviously don't know. Um, but hopefully it will be in a reasonable price bracket so people with disabilities can afford it and use it and help obviously bridge that gap and make gaming more accessible. Obviously going on from that, the Xbox adaptive controller is quite a large piece of kit. I don't, I've, I've seen it and I think it's about 80 centimeters long, probably the size is a bit bigger than a keyboard. Looking at this, this is to scale, you can see it's not much bigger than, than a DualSense controller. So this DualSense size is probably, I don't know if it's good for some people with disabilities, but if you think about desk space, it's actually quite good. But then the button size may be an issue for some people who, who require larger buttons to press because they haven't got that fine motor controls to hit, hit the smaller buttons. But I suppose on the win side, they are bigger than your normal DualSense buttons. Um, so it's, it's one of those ones really where, where I think it's a plus size for me personally because I do not like large devices. I like my desk space to be tidy and small, mainly because I use a mouse and keyboard to game. Or I say a mouse and keyboard, a mouse and the one-handed controller. So I like having enough space to move my mouse across my desk. Um, so having the Xbox adaptive controller and trying to incorporate it into my PC setup, it would just take up so much space. Um, so, so it's one of those things. Now, if somebody was going to ask me, would I get the Project Leonardo or the Xbox adaptive controller? I'd honestly, right now, seeing this, would choose to have the Project Leonardo. I'm not saying this because I've worked with Sony on it, and uh, I have it with Xbox. I'd, I'd purely say this because I think the out-the-box experience just makes it more affordable to me. I, I can't afford to go and spend another, well, I've already spent £270 on, the, um, on my Sip and Puff device. I can't afford to go and spend £80 on the pure Xbox adaptive controller and then £40 per Switch. It's just too expensive and it'll take up too much space. The out of box compatibility um, and workability and usability is just a massive win for Sony in, in my eyes. It just hopefully will make it more affordable for people with disabilities. Now, I don't know at all whether you'll be able to use the um, Project Leonardo controller with Xbox or PC, but I really hope eventually they will allow people to just use these accessibility devices on whatever consoles they like. I know it's typically against what PC, I mean not PC, PC normally allow it. It's normally typical against what Xbox allow and PC Sony allow and PlayStation allow. Normally they have your controller and that controller only works with the console you use. I just really hope that they think, you know what, let's make it more accessible. Let's allow disabled people to have the choice on what controller will work best for them. And I'm actually hoping it will work on PC. PC, please, Sony, just let it work on PC. I would really like to use it and get it to replace my one-handed keyboard eventually. I just think the buttons will work so much easier than me than having to try and push my tiny buttons at the moment. All right, guys, I hope you've really enjoyed this review and hopefully learned a bit of my insight from the blog post. Um, obviously, it really helps if you can like and subscribe, especially 
if Sony and somehow I've broken their NDA, I really hope I've not broken their NDA. Because if so, you'll see me on the street very soon because they'll, they'll sue me and I won't have a house anymore and I'll just become homeless. So I hope I didn't break the NDA. So yeah, guys, like and subscribe. It'll really help me, help me grow my channel and fight this legal battle if I did actually accidentally break the NDA. Ba -ba -doo -da, ba -ba -da -doo -da. Ba da 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 da